Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our ecological forestry in the context of climate change webinar series. Uh, if you're here for that series, you're in the right place. Today, we're going to talk about forest disturbance and its relationship to wildlife habitat. And we're also going to be talking about fire impacts to old growth forests. So I'm going to turn it over now to our technical wizard, um, Gwyneth Daunton, and she will talk a little bit about NCTC's role and how to make sure you're tuned in correctly. And I'll be back in just a minute to introduce our speakers. Gwyneth, go ahead. Well, thanks, Jeff. Hopefully I can be the wizard of sorts. Um, welcome from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm located at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Gwyneth Daunton, and today's webinar is titled Forest Disturbance and Its Relationship to Wildlife Habitat by Brenda McComb, who is the Professor Emeritus from Oregon State University. You'll be hearing a little bit more about Brenda in a second, um, but we're going to go over some pre-webinar items first. I'd like to start out this week's course by sharing NCDC's land acknowledgement with you all. The National Conservation Training Center is located on the ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. These include, but are not limited to, the Massawomack, the Haudenosaunee, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. NCDC is dedicated to building relationships with indigenous communities, and we encourage others to learn more about the lands where they reside on. I'm happy to share a link to those who are interested where you can learn more about the inhabitants of the land where you live and work. I also want to mention that we welcome all students here at NCTC. It is my intention to create a safe and inclusive and productive webinar environment that honors and supports diverse ideas. We are strengthened by diverse perspectives, identities, and we foster the environment where everyone can learn new skills. As such, I will be an ally in this event if anyone experiences access issues or feels unwelcome. You may always reach out to me privately to address your concerns. First of all, as a disclaimer, this product is for educational purposes only, and the views, opinions, and, or positions expressed in this webinar series are those of the guest presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or positions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or Department of Interior. Some of the materials and images may be protected by copyright or may have been licensed to us by the third party and are restricted in their use. Mentions of any product names, companies, web links, textbooks, or other references does not imply a federal endorsement. This webinar is indeed being recorded live and all participants have been muted. It will remain this way for the duration of the webinar, but we want you to participate. So anytime during the webinar, please post questions in the chat, which is open for everyone. To submit a question, first click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, and then simply type your question and make sure that the box is selected for everyone, not just the panelists. So please um, make sure that when you ask questions, they're addressed to everyone, and you can go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat now. To be able to have the best viewing um, potential, um, make sure to change your presentation view. Um, you can access the different view modes in the upper right-hand corner of your screen as shown on this slide. I'm now going to turn it over to Jeff, um, who is going to tell us a little bit more about the series and also introduce our lovely speaker today. Jeff, go ahead. Thanks, Gwyneth. So this, this particular series, um, is part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services um, series that is a partnership among the National Conservation Training Center, our Migratory Birds Program, our Science Applications Program, and also we've had a great partnership with the USDA Forest Service through their Northern Forest Climate Hub and the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, and they've been a great uh, help to us, and it's been a lot of fun partnering with those folks. And you can see on this on, on the screen there, they're the main contacts for this program. You can shift to the next slide, Gwyneth. 
So we've been, this series is one of our 12 part monthly series. This is the third that we've tried in this way. And it, and it talks about small and large scale forest disturbance, such as fire, windstorms, sea level rise, flooding, et cetera, and, and forest pests and how they impact our forest ecosystems. And today you're really gonna hear about how, that, how there are synergistic effects there. Uh, we also are examining ecological silviculture and, and climate adaptation approaches to help inform forest and wildlife habitat management. And so, you know, today's our fourth installment of this 12-part uh, series. And just to give you a little bit of a commercial for next month's uh, January 16th uh, webinar, it's going to be with Andrew Larson of the University of Montana. Tana and Andrew's going to be talking about ecological silviculture for conifer forests in the interior Northwest and the synergistic effects of drought, fire, and insects. So it builds on what we're talking about today. Next slide, please, Glenn. All right. And so to introduce Dr. Brenda McCone, Brenda is today's speaker. We also have Andrew joining her. So I'll also introduce Andrew. But I'll also say that Dr. McCone has been really helpful. Um, in also being part of the team that created this webinar series. So Brenda received her BS in Natural Resources Conservation from the University of Connecticut, also her MS from the University of Connecticut in Wildlife Management. And then her PhD is from Louisiana State University. She has been a faculty member or an administrator at the University of Kentucky, also the University of Massachusetts, Oregon State University, and also Stanford University. She's currently an emeritus professor at at uh, Oregon State University, and she's on the Oregon Board of Forestry. She also is the author of more than 100 scholarly papers and books. Her research focus is generally on wildlife ecology and habitat management for species associated with forests at stand and landscape scales. And I'll also say four of the last five years she has talked has taught our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Forest Ecology and Management course, which is a week-long course. She just handed it over this year to Dr. Brian Pallock. So that has, so that has, that course has been really successful. All right, and now to introduce Andrew, if you can shift to the next slide, Gwyneth, that would be great. And so also joining Brenda today uh, is Andrew Merchell, and Dr. Merchell fits great is a great fit into this chart into this presentation. Uh, he's going to be talking about how fire shapes mature and old forests and temperate rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. And Andrew is part of the ORISE partnership with the U.S. Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest Research Station in Corvallis. He's also director of the Tree, Link, Tree Ring, if I can say that, lab at Oregon State University. And Andrew's PhD is in forest ecology at Oregon State University. His research focus is pretty interesting. He uses tree rings or dendrochronology to develop a shared understanding of how different forest ecosystems function over time. Andrew's particularly interested in how disturbances, mostly fire and forest management have shaped and will continue to shape forest ecosystems in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Those, those tree rings tell a story. With that, we'll turn it over to, to Brenda, and we're looking forward to the presentations. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, let's see, Gwyneth. Yes, there we go. I need to share my screen. If I can find, I think it's, um, hold on just a second. Zach Year of Historical Sorry Fires at that. Beach Park Study Site. I need to change one thing before. Zach, I'm sorry, folks. I need to stop so, Andrew here. Yeah, it's okay. We're not hearing it right this second. We were okay. at first. Yep. I just need to do one thing here first before we get started. Uh, take your time. That should do it. We have a fancy embedded video here with Andrew. So Andrew's captured in the within the slides. I don't know how he got out, but there we go. I'll try. Huh, I can't he seem to get back to Zoom, Jeff. Huh. Uh, we still see you. 
I would just go, I would get out of sharing and get back into sharing. I can't even get there. I'm not sure what's going on here. Maybe you have a screen that's covering over. Try that. That's no, done. that's not it. Exit movement. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, my techno uh, abilities are not as good as they should be here. Uh, they're uh, good. Just, it just it happens to us all. Okay. Do we have a share screen now? It's coming. There, there it is, and we're seeing your whole your whole set. So. Just... Okay. And now I just need to do this. All right. We there we go. Now? We got it. Yep. Thank you. Cool. You go. Great. Great. Thanks. And sorry about all that. My apologies. I had it all set up earlier and then I blew it. Um, so thank you all. And Jeff, thanks for that introduction. And thank you and Tony D'Amato for um, a, uh, uh, assisting me in reviewing this presentation last week. It really helped uh, kind of solidify some things here. Uh, so today, um, Tony and I will be covering a number of things. First, I want to talk about uh, some some fairly simple definitions, uh, terms that sometimes are, are not used correctly, uh, talk about habitat elements and disturbances, and then um, Andrew is going to give you an example, uh, a really fascinating example of how disturbances shape habitat for a species. We'll uh, then move into um, the synergistic effects of disturbances and, um, and stressors on habitat, uh, especially, especially within the realm of climate change. And then finally finish off this presentation with a discussion about how ecological silviculture might be used as the basis for developing uh, prescriptions for managing habitat for a variety of species. So off we go. Um, first, I want to just very uh, briefly define habitat because I hear the term habitat being used in a variety of ways and sometimes it's not always clear what's intended. Uh, within this talk, at least, habitat will be defined as the resources necessary to support a population over space and through time. That is, it is specific to a species. Each species has its own habitat requirements and uh, so the habitat for this uh, little long tail weasel uh, will not be the same as the habitat for uh, any other species that might inhabit this ponderosa pine forest on the on the right. So species specific, that's the bottom line. Uh, habitat is selected typically by many species over a range of levels. Um, so the geographic range level is where in the world does this species occur? Um, then within that, there might be territories or home ranges or other areas over which uh, the species would typically occur. Within that, there are resource patches that uh, the species would use to find the, the food and cover resources that it needs to survive. And then finally, it is those uh, specific food and cover uh, pieces, uh, in this case, carpenter ants for the pileated woodpecker uh, that would be needed for that species to occur. So these are different levels of habitat selection and each level can occur over a, a large range of uh, spatial scales or temporal scales, depending upon the species and the context. So when we're thinking about how disturbances affect species habitat, we need to be thinking about how it affects each one of these levels of habitat selection. So what are those pieces of the habitat that each species might select? And, and I just refer to Aldo Leopold's uh, quote here, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. And so the question is, what are the pieces? And in a forest, uh, there are certain pieces that uh, when they are present in uh, certain sizes, amounts and distributions uh, can meet the habitat needs for a species. And again, it's very species specific. Here are some examples of some of those uh, pieces. Uh, tree species, so um, different tree species provide different kinds of food, browse, bark structure, uh, propensity for cavity formation, those sorts of things. Tree sizes, uh, things that uh, both foresters and wildlife biologists can measure and, and relate to uh, species. Canopy cover, tree density, shrubbing, grass and forb cover, uh, foliage height diversity or ver vertical complexity, uh, dead wood, limbs, snags, logs, tree cavities, litter depth, uh, in the case of the uh, pica, uh, talus, a uh, variety of other sorts of 
pieces of the environment that in the correct sizes, distributions, and, and um, arrangements can meet the needs for any particular species. So that's a lot of background, some fairly simple stuff. Um, another term that's sometimes um, used in a, in, in a not consistent way is disturbance. And uh, for um, many ecologists, uh, distinguishing between disturbance and a stressor uh, can be an important distinction. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, disturbance is a relatively discrete event, such as a fire or windstorm. And it changes the structure, composition, and biomass and other characteristics of that forest in a relatively discrete manner. A stressor is a continuous pressure that causes all or part of a forest to move to a new but different state, but remain relatively stable or at least change slowly over time. So in the top, we have a, a wildfire, discrete event. In the bottom, we have um, uh, insect uh, uh, infestation that can kind of wane and wax and wane as, a, as an eruption occurs and then uh, be not so bad over time in, uh, as uh, conditions improve. So uh, climate change would be a, a stressor or at least the weather patterns that result from climate change. So these habitat elements that we just talked about, how are they, how are they created? Where do they come from? How do we find them? Um, we have biotic, biotic me mechanisms that allow these habitat elements to occur, uh, seed production, regeneration, uh, herbivory, decomposition. And in this example, this is a European nuthatch on a Norway maple that's using this cavity as a um, place to nest. And uh, it is the decomposition of that limb break that's caused that cavity to occur and uh, the nuthatch to use it as a nest site. Um, abiotic factors can also um, drive habitat elements. Uh, so drought, soil erosion, elevation aspect, latitude, and then simply time. And I gave this photo of uh, big leaf maple uh, along a stream side here in Oregon <clears throat> that has a uh, moss depth of uh, three to four inches on the limbs and simply takes time to develop that moss layer. But where we're gonna focus our time here today is on abiotic disturbances, fire, wind, flood, landslides, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, uh, all these dis discrete events that uh, uh, can create uh, a new condition, a new forest condition, such as this uh, sea of snags in front of Mount Washington and the Oregon Cascades. So what about disturbances? How do we characterize disturbances? Uh, disturbance frequency is usually described as a return interval. Uh, that is the probability that a um, disturbance of a particular intensity would recur at a particular point in time. So a return interval of 10-year um, return interval might mean that there's a probability that the fire might reoccur every 10 years. Disturbance intensity influences the amount of organic material destroyed or redistributed, and disturbance size and pattern in, uh, influences the distribution of the habitat elements that are re the result of these disturbances across the landscape. Here's uh, two photos, uh, both from fires occurring this year in Oregon. The one to the lower left uh, is from uh, Eastern Oregon, uh, an intense disturbance. Uh, only thing left are standing dead trees and fallen logs, and even the litter layer is completely gone. Uh, so an intense disturbance. And then the one to the right is the lookout fire at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest in the Oregon Cascades. And um, occurring at about the same time, but you can see that the uh, fire was not as intense. There's still a lot left. Um, and um, we're going to see different trajectories of development following those two disturbances. As, you, as we go through this uh, presentation, I'll be referring to um, Tony D'Amato's presentation, the very first webinar in this series from a few months ago. And this is a slide that, uh, that Tony used in his talk. And, and I really appreciate Tony sharing his slides with me and allowing me to reuse them. Uh, within the ecological silviculture approach, um, Tony and, and Brian have described predominant forest archetype based upon disturbance regimes. And they're listed here. Um, <clears throat> so forests initiated by infrequent severe fear disturbance uh, really reset the clock, if you will. 
uh, forests characterized by frequent low intensity disturbance, primarily fire, create oftentimes more of an open savanna condition. Uh, forests characterized by gap disturbance create these shifting uh, mosaic of gaps throughout the forest. And then uh, forests that are characterized by mixed severity disturbance regimes. And for that, I'm going to give you a little photo here of the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest um, following the lookout fire this year. Um, and this is a photo taken by Mark Schultz uh, from a high point, uh, a fire lookout, I think, uh, looking down onto the H.J. Andrews following the lookout fire. And you can see places where the fire really didn't burn or didn't <clears throat> have much of an effect. Excuse me. <clears throat> Compared to areas where it did burn, but the intensity was low, severity was low. And we still see a lot of green trees, but patches of dead trees. And then medium severity, kind of patches of green trees, but a lot of dead trees, a little bit higher. And then finally, this patch down here in the lower center of the uh, slide, where just about everything is dead. So in one, one slide in one watershed, we can see uh, a mixture of uh, fire severities across the landscape. So the question I would ask you um, is how might tree species uh, be affected by that differentially? Trees with thick bark are going to be less affected than those with thin bark, for instance. Uh, tree sizes, uh, canopy cover, gonna be pretty low down here in the intensely burned areas. Uh, shrub and grass cover, vertical complexity, dead wood, litter death. So all of those habitat elements are affected in different ways giving rise to habitat for different species now and on into the future as these patches um, go through recovery over time. We can say the same thing about hurricanes. So the top photo is from uh, Tony. Uh, this is the uh, photo from the uh, 1938 hurricane in New Hampshire. Uh, the bottom is a pine stand in Florida following a hurricane. Uh, again, different intensities depending upon the um, uh, conditions at the time. Uh, and we can look at hurricane tracks at any point across the eastern U.S. from the NOAA website. And here's an example for New England. So, Jeff, this is what you might expect. Oops. Back. There we go. All right. Uh, floods. Um, we can think about, uh, just we thought, thought about uh, fire return intervals, we can think about flood return intervals. So uh, what, when does a hundred year flood occur? Every hundred years? Well, no, not necessarily. It has a probability of occurring uh, at least once every hundred years, but if we could see two or three hundred year uh, floods within um, a, the course of a decade. Uh, flood intensity determines the amount of organic matter killed or redistributed, and then the severity is, the, is an index to that. So in this example, this is from the Mississippi River floodplain, and uh, the, the uh, authors of this study showed how mortality differed uh, in, uh, in this area following a 195-day intense flood in 1993. And so the high bars are those species that were adversely affected, that is, they're going to be declining in importance in that floodplain environment. And the low bars are the species that are likely to persist and really dominate in that environment in the future. So it's setting the tra a trajectory for recovery is different following that uh, flood. And it's going to take some time to see a forest redeveloped such as it is prior to this flood. At this point, I want to uh, shift over to Andrew, and Andrew's going to talk about uh, how disturbances influence habitat for a rare forest nesting species. So fortunately, Andrew doesn't have to jump in here. He's recorded his for us. So here you go. Hello, my name is Andrew. In today's presentation, I'm going to provide new dendrochronological or tree ring examples of how fire mediates the development of mature and old forest habitats in temperate rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. Forest successional histories can be developed by removing tree cores from live trees. In this photo, a core is being removed from a Douglas fir that established in the year 1185 on the left. Note the char from the fire in 1759 on that Douglas fir tree. The cedar to the right was established in the 1760s immediately after the fire in 1759. 
To determine the year of these historical fires, we, we remove 15 to 20 sections from fire scarred trees at each re reconstruction site. The frequency of historical fires we are documenting is really reshaping our understanding of how fire created contemporary, mature, and old forest habitats in the Pacific Northwest. Each sample we collect is sanded to a high polish. This allows us to cross-state each annual growth ring and fire scar to its exact year formation. This provides us with a robust record of the exact year of historical fires at each of our study sites. I'd like to now provide an example of how fire mediates succession and provides for the development of habitat of a specific species. In this example, the species is marbled murrelet. The marbled murrelet is known as a species of two worlds because it forages in the ocean on schooling fish and invertebrates, but it builds its nest up to 80 kilometers inland in large and mature or old trees. Throughout most of its range, the marbled murrelet is currently listed as threatened or endangered. The current photo shows you an example of a marbled murrelet nest. Notice the downy feathers from the fledged chick on the branch that's covered with a deep layer of moss. Murrelets don't actually construct a nest. This means they're going to be, need branches or other features that are at least 10 centimeters in diameter and covered in moss to lay their egg on a tree. These features are usually provided by large lateral branches that extend from Douglas fir with huge crowns. Nests can also be found on Sitka spruce, big leaf maple, and occasionally on western hemlock trees with mistletoe infection. You'll also notice that there's vertical and horizontal cover from the nest tree and adjacent trees in the stand. This cover likely provides important protection from corvids and raptors in, at a nesting site. The Oregon Marbled Murrelet Project has provided us with 29 study sites that give us an example of what contemporary marbled murrelet habitat is. So our, our next objective is to understand how these 29 examples of habitat developed over time with tree growth and establishment, but also with disturbances. So for each one of these 29 sites in the Central Oregon Coast Range, we're coring the nest tree and four nest adjacent trees, and then 15 additional trees in the surrounding forest. We're also developing records of disturbances like fire and wind from dead trees at each site. Our first important result from the study is the characterization of the age of nest trees at the 29 sites. So the graph below is just showing you the frequency of, of nest trees in different age classes. You can see that most of the nest trees are 160 year old, years old, and many trees are less than 160 years old. Um, this is because much of the Central Oregon Coast Range experienced a large stand replacing fire in 1849. The result that many nest trees are quite young is, or relatively young, is surprising because conventional wisdom suggests that the crown structure and large branches and moss cover required by murrelets for nesting would primarily be found in much older trees. In this study, we've currently found that there's only three of these really old trees that were used as nest trees. So how is it that relatively young mature trees are able to provide large branches suitable for nest platforms? We think it has a lot to do with disturbances that have kept open grown conditions in parts of these forests and allowed rapid growth of crowns um, and branches for, for the Douglas fir that are being used as nest trees. The current graph is showing you an age versus diameter relationship. Note that the trees are, that are approximately 150 years in age have a diameter range from 50 centimeters to 200 centimeters. So a tree that's relatively small could be could be 150 years old or a great big tree that's about six, in, six feet in diameter um, could also be 150 years old. The large diameter trees with huge crowns and suitable nest branches um, we're finding have grown up in open conditions that have allowed rapid growth. Our investigation of disturbance histories at the Marillette stands is beginning to illustrate how these open conditions were created and maintained at the contemporary nest sites. Many of the stands developed have at least one fire. So the middle picture here is just showing you a nest tree with char at its base, um, documenting at least one fire event. We also see nest trees that are developed on the edges of open conditions that were created by past harvests, and examples where windstorms have created um, open stands or damaged trees and then in initiated the development of large nest branches. So the photo on the right here is showing you a tree that had the top, its top broken out, 
slightly by wind and then it sent up a new leader that has provided a great big lateral platform for a mirelet to build a nest on. So in summary this show, slide is showing you that fire, old harvest, and wind events are likely contributing to the open grown condition of these nest trees um, that ultimately provides nest platforms for mirelets. In this slide, I'm providing you with an example of how a nest stand developed over time. The picture in the bottom right is showing you um, a nest tree surrounded by three other large mature Douglas fir. You can see that both the nest tree and its neighbors are growing in a very open gap, and that's why they have very large crowns and very large laterally extending branches. The left graph in this um, slide is showing you the development history of those four trees in this stand. And so time is on the x-axis and then each tree that we've cored has its own individual timeline. So this nest stand establishes after a fire in 1883 and there's an initial cohort of Douglas fir trees that establish on the site and today our, our, that cohort has the nest tree. Um, in 1918, there's a reburn at this site, and you see the establishment of additional Douglas fir after that reburn. And then in 1962, there's a wind vent that results in the establishment of red alder. My point in this example is to show you is that both the second fire and the wind event have kept open grown conditions around the nest tree um, and the immediate neighbors that have allowed the development of the nest crown structure in this stand. We have sampled some much older nest trees in much older forests in a study, and that there's a bit of a different history here. So just an example of another nest stand in the photo, and again, note the char that's showing up on the left side of the tree that's being cored. So now I'm gonna provide an example of one of these old, much older nest trees and how it developed with fire. This is uh, from the Drift Creek study site, and on the graph, you'll see that the nest tree established um, sometime in the late 15, 1500s. There's a fire in this stand in 1868 that is relatively high severity, and it must have killed most of the trees surrounding the nest tree. You can see that after that fire, a cohort of Douglas fir is established. So in the photo on the right, you can see the nest tree, and then the trees surrounding that nest tree are the trees established after the fire in 1868. So what happened at this site is a fire killed the neighbors of the nest tree and provided decades and decades of open grown crown development for the tree. And so it was an emergent tree that grew a very large crown, very large branches after um, the fire created this opportunity in 1868. I want to finish this presentation with a reminder that fire usually isn't stand replacing. In most cases, it edits vegetation like trees at low and moderate severity. Repeated entries by fire and other disturbances over time shapes the development of mature and old trees and old forest habitats. Variability in the tempo and severity of fire results in distinct successional pathways that have distinct endpoints, providing very different habitat conditions. Fire ecologists are just beginning to understand how the diversity of habitats in old forest is not just a product of time, it's the re really the product of repeated fire and other disturbances happening Okay, Jeff, I think we'll uh, take questions for a few minutes here before continuing. Thanks a lot, Brenda. And so, and, and thanks, Andrew, that, that was great. You know, I, I see, you know, occasionally the, uh, Andrew got slowed down, the video got slowed down a little bit and then it was speeding up. I think we, that was for the ASL interpreters specifically, so they could have a challenge out there. But at any rate, but it was pretty good. I, I was still able to hear all of that. So it was great. It, and that's really some interesting stuff. So um, I ha have a question here, you know, for Andrew related to um, the Drift Creek. Ver so first of all, those graphs were really interesting that you were showing, Andrew. And I think in the in the Wolf Creek, and by the way, folks, you guys can you guys can add your your questions to the chat now, please, if, if you would. I, I'm not seeing a lot there right now. So, and we'll also have time for questions afterwards. Um, but at any rate, related to the Wolf Creek fire, well, let, let me say, I guess the, the Drift Creek fire seems like it was, that example seems like it's more typical of what, of what most, most scientists feel like is more typical of marble murelet habitat, where it's, you know, very old trees that are creating this, um, creating the habitat. 
whereas it seemed like the the Wolf Creek example would probably be less expected by most folks that many of the trees that are creating excellent habitat right now are are younger trees than we would expect. Is is that is that a true uh, is that is that the consensus that's out there? So I wonder if if people are surprised by your research. Yeah, um, I think you've captured that correctly. I think the expectation is that nest trees are generally going to be over 200 years in age because it would take that long to develop the larger branch structure. Um, but one of the important things we, we've learned um, about the fire history in the Central Oregon Coast Range is that it was really strongly influenced by a fire in 1849. So the vast majority of trees out there are younger than that fire event. And so um, just the, the most common tree population that's available um, out there is going to be trees that are um, less than 170 years old. That's a really productive area. And if a tree grows um, with a lot of access to resources, we're finding that they can develop these large branches in about 120 years um, on, on the low end. That, that's very interesting. So it, it's also interesting that you mentioned about the 1849 fire. I, I was going to ask you if you, since, I mean, since you have looked at so many um, trees out there um, in the Oregon Coast Range, yeah, I, I was wondering about the difference between kind of modern day fire return interval, say the last 200 years, versus pre um, modern settlement. Um, but it sounds like that may have been somewhat restricted by that large major fire event, but I'll let you speak to that. Sure. So even the most severe wildfires leave patches of surviving trees. So in a lot of sites, you're able to find a few 500 year old trees um, at low density that allow you to stent, extend records further back in time. The really interesting property of the fire regime in the Oregon Coast Range is that it sort of has two fire regimes in one, with one being this infrequent high severity fire regime where occasionally you get really severe fire weather during east wind events that results in large extensive fires where around 60% of the burn area is stand replacing. There's another fire regime in the area where you actually have quite frequent um, fires occurring maybe four or five times a century. Um, and these fires predominantly burned at low and moderate severity and they're much smaller. And so that's sort of the new thing we're adding to our understanding of fire in the coast range is it's not just that infrequent high severity fire that was shaping habitats. There was also a pretty large role for um, smaller low and moderate severity fires shaping habitat over time. All right, great. And so I will take one, I'm gonna take one, grab one more question off of here. And, and actually I'm gonna combine two. I have one from Ed and one from Mead. And, so Ed's asking about the impact of predation between large nest trees uh, and in a burned over landscape. And then Mead is asking about were there were there any differences in, in Merlet nest success rates between old trees and relatively young stands that have grown that have grown to the canopy size requirement for nest site selection? Is that clear or do you need me to read that again? No, I, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, I got to start by saying I'm I'm not a, a murelet biologist. I'm really the dendro ecologist on the project. But I think one of the challenges with understanding um, murelet survival is just how hard it is to identify um, nest nest sites and find murelets. So our sample size for nest trees is really small. I mean, in this particular study, it's 29 different birds. So um, there's lots of different variables that could drive the mortality or, or, or failure of a, a nest site. Um, and there aren't there simply aren't enough trees to determine um, whether or not it's the openness of the site or not that's contributing to the success or, or failure of the nest tree. Um, for example, we do have two nest trees in wilderness areas that have lots of cover around them and long distances from um, clear cuts or, or recent management. And one of those nest trees um, was successful and the other one failed. So it's sort of, in that case, sort of hard to tell if a big patch of undisturbed habitat um, might contribute to nest success because you end up with, with really small sample sizes for, for nest trees. 
Awesome. So it's very interesting stuff, Andrew, and I'm sure we'll have more questions for you um, at the end. And so, Brenda, we'll turn it back over to you. Okay, cool. Thanks, Andrew, for handling those questions. Um, I just want to speak very quickly about um, synergistic stressors and disturbances, since uh, Christina brought this up a little bit last time, but uh, uh, just to give you an example, uh, you know, Andrew just talked about the uh, successional pathways that could occur following different kinds of disturbances, and, and, and in fact, how merlet nests develop following different kinds of disturbances. Uh, here's an example from um, the Klamath Mountains ecoregion of Oregon, uh, public, in a publication just came out recently, uh, where the authors describe predisposing factors such as drought, and we can expect to see, um, uh, well, it, predisposing factors being the, the topographic uh, area, uh, drier sites in, in the Klamath region, um, inciting factors, which are the droughts, uh, which we expect to see more droughts and, and, and more prolonged droughts perhaps in the future given climate change. And then contributing factors, biotic uh, agents, uh, such as the flathead fur borer in this case, uh, that collectively are leading to what they are calling a decline spiral for Douglas fir in this dry site uh, area in the Klamath Mountains. So um, multiple factors contributing to uh, a, a really dramatic decline. And I think I, I'm hoping I'm not taking uh, too much thunder away from the next presentation, who I think will go into this in, in much more detail. Um, but just to give you an example, a conceptual example of how multiple pathways uh, might be dependent upon uh, disturbance intensity, frequency, and context, uh, or stressors too. Uh, we might start out with a drought, which is we're seeing uh, much of Oregon in a drought, uh, prolonged drought now, uh, which causes plant stress. But uh, if the drought ends, and this is a year where it might end, we can see recovery of that forest. Add to it bark beetles and we see uh, rather widespread tree morbidity and mortality uh, with scattered snags, increased fuel. Uh, and if we happen to have an ignition source out there, then uh, we see plant mortality and all the things that Andrew just, just, just described regarding kind of a mixed severity fire regime, but patches which are fairly high intensity and, and could be large. Um, and if some of those large intensively burned patches uh, then become um, dominated by say an invasive grass or some other fine fuel uh, that will compete with any tree regeneration and the regeneration is dependent upon the seed source and how far away it is and the competition with those grasses. Um, and then if we continue to have ignition sources such as lightning or humans, uh, we can get into this sort of circular system which becomes very stable, um, dominated by grasses with very few trees, almost more of a savanna kind of uh, arrangement um, and quite different from where we started out with in, in this forest. So we can find novel states or new states that might emerge as these stressors and disturbances interact with one another. And in fact, it's not these linear sorts of um, events that occur uh, over space and time, but it is the collection of them occur co-occurring with one another. So this little um, diagram that probably will give you a bit of a headache uh, is right out of Dean Urban's book that was just published on disturbances and disturbance regimes. But, but in, in simple form, it is the um, abiotic drivers, wind, lightning, fire, and and uh, a stressor drought um, that kind of set the stage for changes in a forest uh, over time. And then if we have uh, high fuel loads, uh, suppression mortality, uh, insects and diseases or parasites, um, all of those things interact with existing uh, uh, preconditions like topography and soils uh, to enact those, these sorts of um, uh, changes, ec ecological changes over time. Here's an example of a, about a 15 to 20 year old recovery site following an intense fire in the high cascades. And uh, you can see that there's regeneration in there, but there's also a lot of fine fuel and a lot of um, uh, large fuel. 
And if we get another ignition event, which we likely would in this environment where we have lightning striking quite commonly, uh, we can see this reburn. And uh, I visited a site that was reburned uh, just a, a few years ago, and uh, it, there's really not much there. It, it is changing from a, a forest to very much more of a, a savanna kind of system. I've given a link at the bottom here to a, a set of papers that came out in Frontiers in Ecology that um, describe uh, uh, these pervasive stressors and the effects that they have on ecosystems and biodiversity. So I'd encourage you to uh, take a look at that if, if you'd like. All right, now climate change. So uh, we've talked a lot about disturbances, stressors, and how habitat changes as a function of those. Uh, but now we have to think about that in the realm of climate change. And so for this example, I've used the climate change atlas uh, produced by the Forest Service. And I just, for example, pulled up the predictions in terms of changes in um, tree species uh, on the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont uh, under two levels of um, uh, climate change. It's kind of a middle of the road change and then a high intensity uh, climate change. And uh, for this example, they predicted large decreases in the importance values for balsam fir uh, in that forest and large increases um, in the importance values for northern red oak. So let's take a quick look here. Green Mountain National Forest is in Vermont, uh, but take a look at the uh, area over in the Lake States because that's a really good, good example. Uh, balsam fir is an important species in that environment uh, and on through to the uh, northern New England as well. But importance value declines dramatically uh, by the end of the uh, century um, as a result of, uh, of climate change, especially under the high emissions uh, model. Okay. And then if we take a look at Northern Red Oak, we don't see as much Northern Red Oak uh, in terms of its importance value in the upper lake states or, the, or Northern New England, but the predictions are that by the end of the century, we will see dramatic increases in uh, importance value for Northern Red Oak in those, those areas. And those are just two species of many that the, uh, the group has uh, modeled. And so um, I'd encourage you to take a look at that uh, atlas and, and just kind of get a sense for how some of these uh, plant species will change over time. And it's not just the plant species, it's also, uh, they've done a bird atlas as well. Uh, so black Burnian warblers are associated with the conifer forests in the Lake States in Northern New England. Uh, so as those forests decline in uh, uh, balsam fir importance, uh, we would expect to see declines in species in those same regions. In fact, that is what the bird atlas is predicting. By the same token, um, Hooded warblers, which are common in the central hardwoods in so southern U.S., uh, are quite common. We would find them quite regularly in the Cumberland Plateau when I used to work there many years ago. Um, and they're very rare in northern New England in the, uh, in the lake states, although they are, can be found there. Uh, but their detection is likely to increase by the end of the century in these northern areas uh, as hardwoods begin to dominate those areas and the conifers begin to decline. So those are just a few examples of uh, species that uh, might change in their distribution as a result of climate change. The other thing that will uh, that change is, is um, not only the, the forest itself, but the conditions within the forest. And so as we think about how we might manage forest uh, to continue providing habitat for the species that are there now, but might decline in the future, um, we might want to think about below canopy conditions. And so this is Han Kyu Kim, uh, who received his PhD from Morgan State University a few years ago. Um, and uh, I've given you the citation for the work that was recently published. He put uh, data recorders, uh, temperature recorders out at 184 locations across a watershed and um, for multiple years and then counted birds uh, at those same points for multiple years. And what he found was that five species of birds uh, had their trajectories of change generally negative de uh, trajectories, declines, be moderated at sites with cooler microclimates, including the uh, hermit warbler that you see here. Of those five species, two species moderated their negative effects in areas that had complex forests, that is high structural and compositional diversity. 
So as we think about managing habitat for some of these species that might be affected by uh, climate change, uh, these uh, microclimatic refugia might be a, a, a thing to consider and how we might maintain those microclimatic refugia, uh, which could be important to lifeboating these species further into the future to give them a chance to adapt. Um, but also it is problematic in the face of more frequent and intense disturbances in terms of maintaining those refugia through time. Mammals also have shown some um, changes in their distribution or use of habitat conditions in warmer environments. And I've given you an example here from the uh, publication in which mammals tend to move more towards, spend more time in uh, areas with forests, especially in drier, more exposed areas. And then finally, uh, another factor that might be driving some of these relationships is simply the phenological differences in, uh, for, for instance, in this example, uh, caterpillar abundance as temperatures change. And this is from Scotland. Uh, uh, and for every um, five days, or every degree centigrade uh, increase in temperature, we see a five day gray, uh, five days sooner peak of caterpillar uh, eruption in this, uh, in this environment. Uh, meaning that if the birds are nesting at, as they have in the past, but the food resource is occurring earlier, there could be a mismatch. As it turns out, for some species, the European equivalent of our chickadee here, uh, they seem to be adapting, but that's not the case for all species, and it's not something we should assume would be the case for all species. So these phenological mismatches uh, are uh, important things to continue to investigate, and we have a lot to learn there. So what does this mean in terms of uh, how we might think about managing forests using ecological forestry uh, principles and uh, maintaining uh, habitat for, for these species, especially in the face of climate change? Uh, so here's some, some assumptions that, are, that uh, we have used for years uh, using historic range of variability as the basis for uh, designing some of our forest management approaches. Species have persisted for the past thousand years or more with disturbances and stressors. Disturbances and stressors that reflect past conditions should support these species into the future. And historical disturbances reflect the past presence of humans for over 20,000 years in this part of the world. Um, and so it's not without human um, presence in, in their influence. Disturbances and stressors depart from historic conditions will not support these uh, all of these same species. So we're seeing a departure. And in fact, disturbances and stressors of the future will not be like those of the past. That's becoming more clear. This little diagram at the bottom from Tony D'Amato's presentation uh, just illustrates that uh, if you have more pathways, more trajectories for forests uh, as you manage that stand that could go in very, very different directions in terms of species composition or stand structure, there's greater likelihood that the conditions will be met even despite changes in climate and, uh, and other stressors and disturbances uh, to meet the desired ecosystem goods and services. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to meet the needs for all of the animal species that might occur in a planning area. So I'm going to give you a very quick example. Say we have a planning area of 355 species that we're concerned with uh, using ecological uh, silvicultural approaches where we're providing plant communities in serial stages reflecting post-disturbance conditions in the past, present, and future, we might be able to provide simply habitat for um, many of those species in, in that that. Uh, approach alone. So here's an example from uh, Tony's slide uh, in which you have uh, forests, woodlands, and savannas, each being affected by disturbances, either ec ecological um, silviculture or natural disturbances, and each which can return back to a previous condition depending upon the uh, disturbance regime. So the collection of these conditions across the landscape over space and through time uh, should provide habitat for many of those species, but maybe not all. Uh, there also is a mesofilter in which structural elements reflecting post-disturbance conditions are important for a variety of species, and oftentimes that's dead wood. Uh, ecological silvicultural principles do require leaving trees to die and natural cavities to form, uh, meeting the needs for these species. But the question is how many, what size, and what distribution to meet the needs for those species. And so 
the might still be some species that would fall through the cracks, that we would not be able to meet the needs simply by these two previous approaches. Uh, fine filter, uh, species that would uh, not meet their needs without specific management actions. And I'll give you a very simple example here. Ecological forestry does consider, in, in Tony and, and Brian's uh, work, uh, these habitat elements. And then we might ask, well, if those are the elements that we're considering, how what does what do pileated woodpeckers need uh, to be sure that they would be able to continue to use some of those stands in the planting area over time, uh, or western bluebirds, or marbled murrelets, or red trevilles, or rufous hummingbirds, each with specific habitat requirements because habitat is species specific, and we would want to be sure that those were built into whatever prescription uh, that was created using ecological forestry principles. So who might these fine filter candidates be in the face of climate change? Clearly, rare, threatened, and endangered species, species with low dispersal capability, low reproductive rates, late age to sexual maturity, such as this uh, wood turtle that we have here, strong site fidelity, sensitive to moisture, sensitive to high temperatures. And those species that go back to the same place year after year or which stay in the same place year after year uh, might be a maladaptive behavior in the current uh, Anthropocene. So I think it's important to recognize, uh, I won't repeat all of this that uh, Tony provided to you uh, in the first presentation, but, but simply the bolded piece here that the um, ecological silvicultural approaches provide the building block blocks for prescriptions that uh, would meet novel challenges and objectives. So ecological forestry is not the same as habitat management, but it's closer than we have been in a long time. Um, so how do we think about this? Um, here's the current condition for a pine stand in uh, this is in Alabama. Uh, and we wanna have a, on that site, a longleaf pine stand uh, to meet the needs for red carcated woodpeckers and brown-headed nuthatches. Uh, we articulate a desired future forest condition uh, that we want to try to create on that site. And uh, ecological forestry principles can allow us to do that. But the question is, this, this example of longleaf is based upon disturbances of the past, not disturbances of the future. So the question is, if we have a DFC desired future forest condition based upon future disturbance patterns, is it even possible to get that kind of condition that we have, uh, that we want, the DFFC. Are we going to be able to provide habitat for brown-headed nuthatches in the future um, as we move into these novel conditions, uh, or do we need to revert back to um, uh, the RAD approach uh, to be sure that we can at least continue to manage and, and hopefully adapt to uh, the changes that are coming our way? And I know I'm getting short on time, so I'm gonna close it off here with a few take-home messages. Um, stressors and disturbances can create change and eliminate habitat elements for a wide range of species. They always have, they will continue to do so, and the, uh, the conditions are going to change as climate changes. Stressors and disturbances will increase in intensity and frequency as the climate changes, and ecological forestry can provide the foundation for development of descriptions of desired future forest conditions for the full complement uh, of species in the planning area. And then finally, we should consider twin goal sets when considering wildlife habitat on into the future. Lifeboating species for as long as possible as climate changes to allow the uh, geographic range to shift, and then planning to facilitate species that will occur in the future, uh, in the forest in the future. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Hopefully we have about two minutes or so for questions and uh, we can take those questions. We do, and and you did a great job, Brenda. You covered a ton. Uh, I didn't think you could pull that off, but I think you did. So thanks for that, and thanks also to Andrew. And we do have a few questions. Some of them are specific to slides, Brenda. So I'm not sure if you can go back to this slide, but right before Andrew's presentation, Megan was asking in regards to the last slide you had presented, does the other category include invasive species? So this was all the way back um, before Andrew's presentation. And while you're there, <laughs> and, while, and, I, and I have another one from Joe that also asks about a specific 
uh, slide. Um, so, but I'll let you find Megan's question first. And again, um, we do have a few minutes and we can stay a few minutes after the hour if folks want to put in um, questions. Huh. I see some applause showing up. So again, thanks for everyone uh, that joined us today. Is it this so, one? So she, again, her question was in regards to the last slide Brenda presented, does the other category include invasive species? So you, you're down here at others. So yeah, habitat elements must be. Well, so. um, it could certainly. Um, but I think I would view invasive species as uh, more of a stressor on the landscape. Um, that um, uh, we are we are moving from uh, historic conditions where those species had not occurred to a new, more stable environment where they do occur, but the system is functioning differently than it used to um, prior to the arrival of these invasive species. Um, and the function of the, of the system is changing, and the function of the system to provide these habitat elements is changing. So for instance, in this example, if we had species that um, were highly associated with a certain shrub species for uh, food or cover, and that was replaced by an invasive shrub, would it function the same way? In some cases it might, in some cases it might not, and we just need to be come back to the individual species needs. I don't know if that addresses our question, though. I I, I, I think it so. does. I, no, okay. I think I think that does. And so Joe Hendricks was asking about um, when you were when you had the both the linear um, uh, disturbance models where you were where you where you had uh, the synergistic effects. Those two, uh, you had a series of diagrams, um, yeah. and and so. He says, please explain the seed source variable in the downward spiral. Ah, yep. Let me get to that one. Uh, that one? Is that? Yes, I think that's it. Yes. So um, as we think about fire uh, creating more high intensity burn patches, and oftentimes, and Andrew, you correct me here where I get this wrong, uh, those high intensity burns tend to be larger in size. Um, and uh, if they are, then uh, we need to think about well, what's the seed source uh, from the surrounding trees to be able to repopulate that site. And if, if the burns are, are more intense and the, and the seed source is further away, uh, then we might not see such successful regeneration from surrounding uh, trees because they may simply be too far away or they may not be in the wind shadow of, um, of prevailing winds. Uh, and instead what we might get are species which would compete um, more significantly with the regeneration. All right, that's great. Okay, and I do have a clarification. Andrew, I, I think you have a great answer there. It depends on the, the specific ecosystem and historical fire regime, but there certainly are examples um, in, in particular, the Western US where patches of severe fire are much larger than they used to be and post fire conditions and lack of seed source are leading to a, a non forest state after those fires. Great. No, thanks, Andrew, for that add on. And so Megan did clarify the earlier question about the, um, the, the invasive slide and, and she said it was a slide that also had a maple and an oak category that were circle graphs and she thought it was ah. about floodplains um and so that might yeah yes that helps, that helps. Uh, that's not it though uh let me try this and then so i see we're at 202 but we can stay for a few minutes longer i have a question from john i'm going to ask you once you get back to megan's Is that, that the one, Megan? So, if, oh no, maybe, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Maybe the one, okay. Well, let, let sure me give you, you, yeah, I'm not either. So let me give you John's question. Um, and this is, how do we replace vibrant open habitats historically created by beaver activities now that beaver populations are thought to be only a fraction of their pre- colonization levels. And I, I can relate to this. I have a 
a beaver meadow in my front yard. And, I, and so, um, you know, I think there were a lot more of these on the landscape uh, previously. I, and, and in the e, in the Northeast, for instance, in Maine, I suspect we didn't have any uh, red maple uh, swamps. I suspect they were all beaver meadows. So, um, so again, I'll let you answer that. How do we replace vibrant open habitats historically created by beaver activities now that beaver populations are thought to be only a fraction of their colonization levels? Yeah, I think, um, well, again, I, I will defer to uh, if Tony is on, he could probably give a better answer than I could. But uh, given that beaver habitat are these wetland areas where they uh, they alt that they alter with their dam building, uh, and then flood areas, um, you know, the question is uh, how can we replicate that kind of an environment? Well, there are two two approaches. One is you're killing trees. The beavers are killing trees by flooding. Uh, so. Um, using that um, structure and composition following the floods as a template uh, for developing ecological silvicultural approaches would be my first approach. Um, and uh, so that would mean keeping trees um, thinned, uh, active management to keep them thinned uh, or using fire if it's possible to use fire. In some cases it wouldn't. Um, but then also in streamside areas where it might be more appropriate or, or swampy areas where it might be more appropriate, uh, but where there's flowing water uh, using uh, beaver analogs uh, to create some disruption in the stream, allow um, material to collect behind it, uh, create some more of a flooding environment. Um, and then finally, uh, where there are streams, don't channelize streams, let the stream uh, bang around and and be um, uh, be fluid, literally and figuratively, across that floodplain uh, to create a variety of conditions. But I would use the the beep, the conditions following beaver um, uh, dam establishment and the resulting ecological succession that occurs in the system behind the dam uh, as the template for um, uh, designing ecological silvicultural prescriptions. Great. So thanks for that. And again, I think we're we're at about 206. So I think we'll cut off the questions there and let the speakers have a break. So thanks again to Brenda and to Andrew and to Gwyneth and, and NCTC. And thanks especially to all the participants. And again, hope you can join us um, next month uh, for Andrew Larson when we look deeper into this uh, issue of disturbances. All right, thanks to everyone and hope everyone has a great holiday. Thanks everybody.